Good afternoon, everyone. The Senate Committee on Natural Resources will now come to order. Will the Secretary please call roll? Senator Flores? Present. Senator Hansen? Senator Gogachia? Senator Pazina? Present. Senator Scheibel? Thank you so much. We do have a quorum with three of us present, and please do mark Senators Hansen and Scheibel present when they arrive. Before we begin today, I'd like to provide some general housekeeping reminders. Please do silence your cell phones and electronic devices, otherwise Senator Goa will be answering your calls from here on out. <laughs> The public is advised that during meetings, legislators and staff are using laptops to view bills and exhibits and not for personal reasons. We're trying to be as paper free as possible. Please do not think this is a sign of inattention or disrespect. Please note that we are required, requiring everyone to submit exhibits in an electronic format the day before the meeting. A few reminders before testifying in front of the committee as we do have three bill hearings and a presentation today. We do ask that you sign in by the door. We ask that you give the committee secretary your business card if you have one prior to testifying. And even if you're not testifying, you may want to sign in just so that there's a record of whether you may be interested in a particular bill in case the committee would like to reach out to you at a later date. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and organization and spell your name for us. Then turn the microphone off each time that you've completed speaking. If you have handouts for the committee, we ask that you provide 10 hard copies to the committee secretary for use by the public. We'll be taking public comment at the end of each meeting and we'll be limiting comment to two minutes per person to ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak. Please feel free to provide any additional comments in writing to the committee secretary so that they may be added to the record. I would also say as well, because we do have a busy day today, we have a presentation and then three bill hearings. Please do keep that in mind as you come up to testify or come up to offer, actually, we of course look forward to hearing everything you have to say in support while testifying. As you come up to testify, whether in support, opposition or neutral, we really look forward to hearing it. But do keep in mind, we have three bill hearings and everyone's time is valuable. So we want to ensure that we get you out of here before midnight. Thank you again so much. With that said, we are going to start off today with a presentation by the Department of Wildlife. And we ask that Alan Jen, the Director of the Department of Wildlife, please come forward to the table and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. For the record, Alan Janae, Habit or <laughs> that was my previous title, um, uh, Director, Nevada Department of Wildlife. I um, appreciate the opportunity to give you an overview of the department here today. Um, just to get started, uh, I wanted to, oh, maybe I won't, wanted to give you an uh, introduction to the leadership that I have here with me today. Um, I have Deputy Director of Resources, Mike Scott, and Deputy Director of Administrative Services, Jordan Goshert, and Alejandra Medina, who is our Acting Legislative Liaison. Um, our other leadership folks are back at the office taking care of things, um, and you can see them here in this picture. Um, we have two vacancies currently um, yet to be filled as our Habitat Division Administrator and our uh, game division administrator. I don't know why, but I keep having a problem with my button. The department mission is the same as it's been for years. It's to protect, conserve, manage, and restore wildlife and its habitat for the aesthetic, scientific, educational, recreational, and economic benefits to citizens of Nevada and the United States, and to promote the safety of persons using vessels on the waters of Nevada. Our department structure, if you look at this here, you can see, uh, you can see three regions, 
uh, depicted on the map across the three different colorations with the western region, region eastern region, and southern regions. Uh, we have seven divisions, um, data and technology, conservation, education, law enforcement, game division, fisheries, wildlife diversity, and the habitat division. In total, 329 employees make up the department. Um, approximately 50 of those are seasonal staff, and nine of those are our wildlife commissioners. And so when you look at that, there's roughly 270 employees. Um, we are one of the smallest wildlife agencies in the United States, um, especially for the amount of land that we cover. But our people are very purposeful and passionate. Um, we think we do a very good job with what the, the people that we do have. Um, you'll probably a common theme among the state agencies is, is we are sitting somewhere in the neighborhood of a 20% vacancy rate. Um, if you look into law enforcement, depending on which day, we're probably about 26% vacancy rate there. Um, we have 150 buildings spread across the state, 33 radio sites, 14 wildlife management areas that manage over 157,000 acres, eight major facilities, and four hatcheries, again, across those three divisions. Our broad stat, NDL has a broad statutory charge. Uh, we are the sole state responsible for the conservation of nearly 900 wildlife species. NDL's law enforcement division is comprised of category one peace officers responsible for public safety on waterways and enforcement of wildlife laws. Often when folks think of our game wardens, they don't think of them as category one officers. And not everyone understands that uh, our game wardens are, are those law enforcement officers on the water. And so when you contemplate down in Clark County on Lake Mead and Mojave, um, our, our game wardens are down there, um, you know, trying to save boaters, trying to enforce boating laws, and very concerned with general citizen safety. As I mentioned before, Nevada is a very large state, seventh largest state, and most everybody knows that it's 85% federal land. Um, and as I said before, we're among the five smallest wildlife agencies in the nation. We are charged with participating in the federal NEPA, uh, National Environmental Policy Act process, and commenting and representing wildlife on projects proposed on federal lands. We have a very unique funding model when you consider us to many other state agencies. Over 95% of our budget consists of user-derived funds um, from Pittman-Robertson funds, which are derived from excise taxes on guns and ammunition and archery, and Dingle-Johnson, which is derived from excise taxes on motorboat fuel, small engine, fishing tackle, and electric outboards, things like that. Additionally, we also receive Coast Guard funding and public boating safety funds. Um, license revenue and tag sales are the generally the state match to those. Um, and we often get on, especially Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson, we get three to one match on that. And so it gives us a lot of opportunity to use those user derived fees to be matched to those federal funds to support 98% of the agency. Currently, only 2% of our agency budget is supported by the general fund. You can see that there on that graph. So in the director's office, uh, we have 28 positions. And as I mentioned before, the Wildlife Commission and the county advisory boards fall underneath the director's office. We have the physical services and centralized costs as well as human resources and engineering and facilities. The proposed budget for the next biennium in FY24 for the director's office is 9.9359740 million. And in FY25, it's $9,699,997. Some 
So when you think about the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commission, under NRS 501-171, Wildlife Commission is comprised of nine gubernatorial appointees with a term of three years and a two-term limit generally. Um, one of those commissioners is a conservationist, one farming representative, one ranching, one general public, and five members who during at least the last three of the four years immediately preceding their appointment held a resident license to hunt and fish in, in Nevada. And other consideration and guidance for the commission is NRS 501-181 allows them to establish that broad policy for wildlife management and boating safety in the state of Nevada and provide that guidance to NDOW to adopt regulations for wildlife management, boating safety, and adopt regulations for hunting, trapping, and fishing, and consider NDOW recommendations that they're that body that sits in that central place to create those regulations in consideration of NDOW's recommendations, the county advisory boards, and the public comments. So, looking at the public process of the commission, is the commission, as I've just mentioned, is, is that central body that hears from the recommendations based on biology from the Department of Wildlife, takes that in consideration with the county advisory boards and that input process, and then also the general public, and they weigh that in their development and guidance in policy and regulations, and they push that down to the department to then implement and enforce policy and regulations. In the Data and Technology Service Division, we have 30.63 positions, very specifically. Um, one of those is a seasonal position, obviously. The Data, data and Technology Service Division has licensing, hunting application and draws, customer support, GIS systems, voting registration, and information and technology. In FY24, the budget is proposed for Five million one hundred eighty-five thousand one hundred sixty-six dollars, and in FY twenty-five, five million one hundred fifty-six thousand six hundred forty-seven dollars. Data and Technologies collects approximately eighty-five percent of the of the sportsman's revenue, so they're kind of that storefront um, that takes care of our licensing, hunting tag applications, watercraft registration. In 2022, big game applications generated over 14 million in just seven weeks. And we're in that process right now. We just opened last week and uh, we are actively receiving big game applications. <clears throat> Our Cal Center receives over 23,000 calls annually from the public and 15 counter staff across the state perform 21,000 or 2,100 inspections of vessels annually. DATS has 32 full-time employees and seasonal staff in six offices across the state. Many of those are rural locations uh, such as Ely, Winnemucca, Elko. We've got offices in those locations to serve those communities. In the Conservation Education Division, we've got 24 positions. They take care of our hunter safety training, our hunter and angler education, wildlife education, media and public relations, urban wildlife. Often these guys are the face of the agency. They're the ones that you'll see um, promoting and doing news interviews um, and, and being the face out there with the community. Um, in FY24, we're looking at a budget of $4,767,032. And in FY25, $4,901,258. Conservation education, as I mentioned before, uh, oversees all department education, information sharing, and communication on all things. They also oversee the hunter education program, and uh, not everybody that doesn't hunt doesn't understand that since 19, if you were born after January 1, 1960, is that you are required to have hunter education in order to have a hunting license in the state of Nevada, and that's that's been in place for some time and that's helped uh, you know, modify and trend down the number of accidents, hunting accidents in the state of Nevada. That program is supported with over 300 volunteers, instructors that we use their in-kind time to match our federal grant to teach that program. Um, 
And so it is a very successful program. It's been going for a very long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, just recently in 2021, we did an update to our endow.org mobile ready website. And uh, if you've been there, you can tell that it is a much fresher uh, website than previously. Uh, and, and looking at this here, <clears throat> we actively work to engage 118,000 customers via email. Um, if you are one of our uh, constituents uh, or users, you'll often see those emails, even sometimes texts where, you know, we're trying to let you know of opportunities that exist in your neighborhood or opportunities that might be upcoming, um, such as this big game draw season. Also, uh, Conservation Education covers the Urban Wildlife Program. In 2022, Endow received 4,703 urban wildlife calls. Most were regarding black bears, waterfowl, and coyotes. Staff spent an estimated 7,300 and 11 hours and traveled approximately, I'll say 44,000 miles, reserving urban wildlife issues during 2022. The Urban Wildlife Program gives callers the tools to reduce conflict through education. So we oftentimes, we're, we're not always sending our employees to go address the problem because there's so many calls that we can't do that. But we try to help them, give them the information to be able to solve the problem themselves. Oops jumped past. Law enforcement, we have 54 positions in our law enforcement division, our wildlife enforcement, boating enforcement, public safety, boating education, dispatch services, radio technology, all fall within the law enforcement division. In FY24, we have a proposed budget of $8,566,992 and in FY25, a budget of $8,549,000 thousand three hundred and forty two dollars as I mentioned before um, we are uh, our endow game wardens are one of the smallest conservation officer forces in the United States uh, they cover the the highest numbers of miles per law enforcement officer um, and they take care of everything from wildlife boating and public safety um, across those 110,000 square miles of Nevada. We also provide dispatch services for ourselves and also other partner agencies, um, and we do that 18 hours a day year round. In 2021, our 2022 wardens contacted 10,035 hunters, anglers, and trappers with 595 wildlife violations and 125 firearm violations. 1,504 boats, and found 840 violations of statutes and regulations. <laughs> and <clears throat> we also administer over 500 hunting and, fishing, hunting and fishing guides and outfitters annually, and they also oversee the Operation Game 3 uh, program that allows that opportunity for folks to report uh, crimes should they, should the, any wildlife crimes should they see any. Moving on to the game management division, there's 35 positions um, across the state. Those are the typical ones that many people know us for. Take care of big game survey, inventory, seasons and harvest and quotas, landowner conflict resolution, wildlife health monitoring, research and collaboration, and air operations. In FY24, we're looking at a budget of, proposed budget of $10,702,602. And in FY25, a proposed budget at $10,409,491,000. As I mentioned before, in the game management, we have two uh, helicopters, two Bell 407 helicopters that we use for multiple uh, aspects of our wildlife management program. Some of that is wildlife surveys. Others is slur slinging of materials for projects in remote locations, and also, um, not this year, but in previous years, um, during those drought years, uh, we were actually using them to haul uh, water to our uh, water catchment uh, aprons out associated with our guzzlers. 
Um, also, we have a wildlife health program within the game management that consists of a veterinarian, a biologist, a wildlife technician, and they conduct surveillance for various wildlife diseases across the state. Uh, also within the game division, um, this is something that's been continuing to grow as our population of bears continue to grow, is our black bear conflict response. We have two full-time biologists to respond to citizen complaints about black bears, and oftentimes we use these uh, Karelian bear dogs to help with adversive uh, conditioning to try to get them where they don't want to be hanging around where humans are. So. We were asked specifically um, in one of the other presentations to include an update on Nevada moose population. Um, we have had records of moose back to the 1950s. Um, there's pretty, pretty infamous accounts of, of some um, throughout time. Uh, most recently in 2023, our aerial surveys have documented 54 moose, 22 bulls, 21 cows, and 11 calves. Our moose management goals are to maintain and improve abundance and distribution, allow for natural expansion into suitable but unoccupied habitats, and to identify and encourage recreational opportunities for all user groups. In our fisheries division, we've got our uh, 46 positions in fisheries management. That conducts our sport fish production, fish hatchery management, native aquatics, aquatic health monitoring, and aquatic invasive species. In FY24, we've got a proposed budget of $11,869,565, and in FY25, a proposed budget of $9,787,942. Fisheries management, um, we have over 500 fishable waters with more than 30 different game species. 100 species of native fish and amphibians, and 27 of those which are federally listed. Um, we continue to promote and create Nevada urban fishing programs um, and trying to attract anglers. Um, there are four fish hatcheries spread across the state, three rays and rear trout for sport fishing purposes, and the one down on the Colorado uh, raises native species for the Colorado system. We also have the aquatic invasives program within the fisheries division, and those are those uh, seeking out the aquatic invasive species like uh, you see down on Lake Mead, um, and you'll see those inspection st stations and decontamination units that'll help to ensure that the boats are, are clean and do not have invasive species. Um, in last year, I think they did over 4,000 inspections on watercraft in the state of Nevada. Moving on to wildlife diversity, um, there's only 13 positions in our wildlife diversity division. Um, they take care of managing our state wildlife action plan, and they manage our non-game species as well as deal with our threat and endangered species and the Tahoe Environmental Improvement Program. In FY24, have a proposed budget of $2,458,309, and in FY25, proposed budget of $2,498,749. Wildlife diversity manages those non-game terrestrial species, including reptiles, mammals, and most birds, and coordinates the development and implementation of the State Wildlife Action Plan, which we just recently updated uh, this year. 267 of the roughly 900 different species are designated as species of greatest conservation need, and uh, the wildlife, as I mentioned before, the wildlife diversity team represents Endow on the Tahoe Environmental Improvement Program. Moving on to habitat, we've got 39 positions within the habitat division. Uh, they have a development project review program, an de industrial development program, habitat restoration rehabilitation, Nevada's part Nevada Partners program, water development, and wildlife management areas. In FY24, there's a proposed budget of 
$12,723,000 and an FY25 proposed budget of $12,793,350. Let me start over. $12,793,359. <clears throat> Trying to move fast for you. Habitat division is lead division within the agency that leads up our comment into the natural and national environmental policy project process. Um, we comment on over 500 projects annually. Um, additionally, we manage and monitor 88 industrial artificial pond permits. We have two water development crews that maintain over 1,700 water developments or guzzlers, artificial water catchments that I spoke of earlier. Um, we have 13 designated wildlife management areas totaling over 157,000 acres. And in the last five years, there have been greater than 505,000 acres of habitat restoration completed. Uh, recently, uh, we had that uh, the passage of the energy review program some while back, but in 2021 and 2022, we reviewed over 80 different proposed energy projects through that program. Recent accomplishments for the division are the creation of the Hunt and Fish NV apps um, that give information to our users on opportunities and places to go recreate. Um, most recently, in the fall of 21-22, we implemented 62,862 acres of re restoration and rehabilitation actions. We also recently had the establishment of the Carson Lake, Argena, or Carson Lake and Argenta Wildlife Management Areas. Um, in law enforcement, they have had the deployment of the body-worn cameras for all state game wardens. Uh, urban fishing access, we are developing the Lenar Pond in uh, Sparks and the 12th Street Pond in Elko for greater urban fishing opportunities. We're also just recently finished the Cummins Lake boating facility improvements. And we have the creation of the Mule Deer Enhancement Program within the last few years that has had the approval of over 37 projects to improve the condition and state of uh, our mule deer in this state. As I mentioned, the State Wildlife Action Plan was revised this last year and has a management plan for 267 species of greatest conservation need. Also, recently, you'll remember that we simplified, modernized our license system and enhanced the user experience and increased the number of participants and revenue. Also, uh, we completed our five-year strategic plan. Challenges that face NDOW, um, number one, again, as I said before, is, is that recruitment and retention um, of our employees uh, were 20% vacancy and higher in law enforcement. Um, we, we see this for, for multiple reasons. Um, I, I think it boils down to the, uh, the competitive salaries of federal agencies. We've seen a number go that way. Um, counties also um, have more competitive packages to offer those people. and so. Uh, we see that, but also is this just as far as recruitment, um, we see that we aren't seeing the number of people um, applying for those jobs. Um, but we also understand talking to some of the universities that they aren't seeing the number of people going into natural sciences that they used to. And so um, this is something we're going to have to try to deal with and try to work towards to try to increase the number of people that want to work in this field. Um, this is an ironic uh, challenge um, given what's going on outside right now, but we are coming out of a long-term drought. Um, hopefully this is the start of a wet period and we don't have to deal with this anymore, but um, all of our wildlife populations in this state have suffered because of the drought. And uh, despite this winter being as good as it's been, as, as that's also creating some hard conditions right now that our, our wildlife are still realizing and, and it's probably only being the results of, or the consequence of the drought is only magnified by this hard winter because they didn't 
go into this tough winter in the, in the body condition that they could have had it been a better uh, water year. Um, also, the other third challenge we're facing here in Nevada is habitat loss and conversion. Um, our sagebrush habitats in this state, we've either lost or converted 55% of our sagebrush habitats in this state. Um, the, the wildfire cycle and annual invasive grasses is changing the reality for our wildlife populations, but also for our people who recreate and make use of those. And so um, we, we continue, as I spoke to, we continue to invest in rehabilitation and restoration, but when you have million acre wildfire years, you just fall behind. Um, and so while we feel pretty proud about our achievements in working with federal land managers, is we still continue to see you know, that, that gap between what we do and our losses, it just continues to expand. And so with that, I wrap up and I stand for any questions. Thank you so much, Director Janae. We also really appreciate your flexibility because we know this presentation got moved when we ended up with the joint hearing on the judiciary and canceling, and then also moving up to the front of today's agenda. So it's very much appreciated. Do we have any questions from the committee? All right, one, uh, and just, so I'm going to hand it over to Senator Goakachia and then I have a comment after that. Thank you. Uh, just a couple very brief. Uh, you have the three hatcheries, you say your ear trout. Where do you get your other sports fish, the bass, perch, bluegill? Do you buy them out of state? Thank you for the question, Senator. Yes, we do. We, we actually buy those. We'll uh, find a vendor. I believe one of our recent vendors uh, for warm water fish this year is out of Utah. All right. And then uh, you didn't mention the Cave Lake contract. I know it's been let. Do you yep. want to touch on that? Thank you again for the question, Senator. Yes, uh, Cave Lake. That contract has been let. Um, I think that hopefully by the end of this year, we'll see that project completed and uh, we'll be refilling that dam. So that's, that's great news. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, one of the challenges you mentioned was recruitment and retention. We do have some legislation that's coming before the Senate shortly, which I would love to speak with you about at a later time, which I think may help. So we'll take that offline. But thank you so much. We really appreciate your sharing. And any further questions? All right, thank you so much. We will let you step out of the, away from the table then, and we appreciate all of your time and flexibility. And we're going to now open the bill hearing on Senate Bill 312, revises provisions relating to wildlife. And we will welcome the bill sponsor, Senator Hansen, to the table. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Ira Hansen, representing Senate District 14, which includes 34,000 square miles of the state of Nevada, including most of Washoe County, all of Humboldt County, Pershing County, Lander County, large sections of Eureka and Elko County. In those counties, uh, hunting uh, is a huge issue. Um, I'm actually a lifetime member, in fact, this marks 30 years, I'm a lifetime member of Nevada Bighorns Unlimited. And with me today is a another member of NBU, and we'll be getting into the bill in a minute here um, with more details as to what's going on there. But what the, the purpose of the bill really boils down to uh, is, is fairly simple. NBU has big banquets, as does several other major non-government organizations, NGOs, and they have um, auctions at those where you can sell different items. And Mr. Belding approached me several months ago and said, hey, there is a law now that kind of prevents me from taking um, animal heads and converting them into various forms of furniture, which are then auctioned off, and the proceeds are then used by organizations that, not for profit, but for the, the uh, various wildlife-oriented things that they do. So that is the main purpose of the bill in Section 1. Section 2 came about because of, and I'll... And I'll get into that in a minute. I got my Nevada Big Game application booklet, and you guys have that there. And in it was a section on shed antlers. And when I read it, the last sentence said, it is unlawful to pick up antlers still attached to a skull called the deadhead. 
And I was going, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't know that was illegal. Um, I'll get into that in a minute, but I want to start with section one. Section one, I'm going to have Mr. Belding walk us through and the reasoning behind it and what, what the intent behind it is as well. With your permission, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Mel Belding, lifetime resident of Nevada. <clears throat> I want to thank Mr. Hansen for sponsoring this bill and the time today that you're giving me to explain what I'd like to do. Um, you can all um, read the language of, of the bill. I would like to get in the nuts and bolts of the reason why I'm doing this. In the past, we have taken a deadhead, whether it be a mule deer, an elk, a bighorn sheep, an antelope, and we have offered, we, we've put it into furniture, mostly a coffee table surrounded in glass. We've made numerous um, table lamps, standing lamps, and this, I found out, was illegal. Um, we had no intentions of doing anything illegal, but it, it is. And that's what I want to change. What I would like, my intent of this, is to a person, an individual, can donate a deadhead to an NGO, a 501c3, like NBU Reno, Fallon, NBU Elko, or Elko Bighorns Unlimited, NBU Midas, there's, there's a number of, of these people that would take advantage of this. Um, and he can donate this to the NGO. The NGO then can get the permission from the department. Um, I'd like to see a seal put in this horn. And then they can offer it for raffle, auction, or for their own personal use. That's really the, the nuts and the bolts of this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, if I could, I'll jump to section two of the bill. Uh, there is a conceptual amendment, which you should have uh, in your packet, I hope. Um, because the rules on copyright are a little confusing, I'm not sure what was given to you, what can be put on the screen. So hopefully you've got everything in the package for it. Now, the purpose of section two originally, and this is still the main purpose, if, for example, Senator Pazina Chair Pazina is out at Lake Mead and she and her kids go for a hike in the hills and they get lucky and they come across a bighorn sheep skull or something like that and they bring it back to, to bring it home. Uh, that is what's called a deadhead or a dead skull, okay? And I didn't know that's illegal. I have, I have a bunch of them, frankly, that I found over the years. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to find a couple of nice bighorn sheep ones, a ewe bighorn sheep, elk, mule deer, and so forth. So. When I found out, when I read the regulation that I was talking about in my, my um, brochure for buying tags or getting, applying for tags, it now said that the commission basically has made that illegal. There is some debate. It may be already illegal. So what we wanted to do was simply make sure that if you are out in the hills and you find a deadhead or if you find an antler in one of the counties where it's illegal to possess those during certain windows of time, that if you're not going to sell it, in other words, you're just going to take it home and show it to kids or whatever, that that is not a, an illegal act. However, in the original draft of the bill, and this is where some serious opposition came up today, actually, uh, you'll notice in the original bill, it's crossed, there's a cross out. The commission shall adopt regulations for the taking of shed antlers. We are getting rid of that in the conceptual amendment. We want the commission. The commission's done a tremendous amount of work on this issue, and we want what they have already done and put in law to remain in place. The only attempt we're trying to do here is simply make sure that as part of that, and that's what the amendment says, that they, the, the, the amendment says the commission shall adopt regulations for the taking of shed antlers. That's the part that's crossed out of my bill. We're putting that back. And then the new language is the regulations must allow a person to take or gather shed antlers or skulls or heads with antlers attached for personal non-commercial commercial use and regardless of whether the person holds a permit or tag for the animal. Now, obviously, the intent of that is just what I just described. There are just a couple of, of cases where that would happen. Now, if you want to gather those things. Now, 
without getting too much into the weeds on the, on, on the shed antler stuff, that is actually a commercial thing that people come to the state and do. Out of curiosity, the other day I took the class. You have to get a permit, and I just did it. You have it in, in your file there. And uh, I passed with a 90. I flunked a couple things. Uh, but I, I did make it. Uh, I did double check to see what answers I'd goofed up on. Now, one thing that was interesting is question 15 in that test is this question. If you find a big game animal you believe died from natural causes or human involvement, such as an accidental collision or wound caused by a hunter, you may take or possess the antlers or head of the animal. Yes, sir. and it was true or false. That is false under current law. What we're, what we're trying to do here is make that true. If you find an animal out in the hills, especially the deadheads, the skulls, you should be able to take that without any fear of, of, of uh, getting in trouble with the Department of Wildlife. And that's really the intent of that. Now, if you're going to sell those, if you're out gathering antlers during the windows of time where it's allowed in, I think it's White Pine, Eureka, Elko, Lincoln County, I think there's four, maybe five, huh? No, I'm sorry, is Nye in it too? Anyway, whatever kind of counties it is, if you're going to gather them in that window, you will have to do what I did. You still have to pass this, and then if you gather a, a deadhead along with the other types of antlers, you can commercially sell them, okay? But what I want to do, and the whole intent of Section 2, uh, is to make sure that for somebody who's just out in the hills and picks up an antler, uh, and, and you know, I think 99.9% .9 of the citizens of Nevada have no idea what the law is right now on that. What I don't want to do is have people who are completely uh, unintentionally violating the law getting citations for doing something as simple as picking up an antler and taking it home or finding one of these deadheads in the hills. So that's the purpose of Section 2. Now I have some discussions with some of the folks behind me, um, and they, they are, there's some concern. Uh, this bill's been around for three or four weeks now. Mel and I worked on it. And uh, we went through LCB, got the amendments drafted. There are still possibly some conceptual things we may need to fine tune a bit in the bill, but the original intent is still there. What we want to do is just make sure that number one, Mr. Belding here and people who operate in these NGO environments will be able to take animals, go through the process laid out in the bill, and then sell those things at an auction for the benefit of the wildlife of Nevada. And two, if somebody is a non-commercial person just going out and picking up a deadhead or an antler to make sure that they are not penalized for that. Also, just so you know, the penalty for that, because we have a demerit system. In fact, I wrote the demerit system back in 1995 and got that in law. And Dave Humpke actually sponsored it for me back then, so it shows I'm getting old. That's that been in place for a long time. The demerit system has an all or nothing kind of a thing, though. So if, for example, um, uh, Chair Pazina picks up the skull I'm talking about, and for some reason somebody calls it in and says, hey, this lady's got it. Even if the judge says, well, it was a non-incidental take, you pay $50, she still gets whatever the, the demerit penalties would be. And they are six, which is fairly high. If you get 12, you lose your license for several years in some cases. So we want to make sure that we want to protect everybody uh, that does something that is absolutely unintentional as far as violating the law by simply making sure the law is clear. You can pick up dead heads or antlers in certain cases without a commercial collection license. So, Madam Chair, that uh, somewhat of a nutshell is the, the intent behind the bill. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the committee? Senator Scheibel. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to clarify kind of the difference between Section 1 and Section 2 with the conceptual amendment because um, I would think that picking up a deadhead in order to donate it to Bighorns Unlimited would be a non-commercial use. Uh, but then I did notice that Section 1 refers to the whole carcass of a big game animal. And so I don't know if it's actually common to find or utilize whole carcasses or um, if I'm missing some other uh, nuance to the reason to, to spell out the process for doing an auction in Section 1. Mel Belding, for the record, thanks for the question. It does refer to the carcass of a big gay mammal, but if we read further on, I'm going to submit the request for the, that the antlers and horns of the big gay mammal be donated to the nonprofit. But. Got it. So basically, the idea is if I am out hiking at Lake Mead and I find the carcass of an animal. Is the intent that I'm able to take that whole thing or only antlers and deadheads? Go ahead. 
my understanding is you could, in theory, take the whole, whole carcass. I don't think there's any law against collecting bones in the hills. Um, now, obviously, if it's a fresh carcass, like somebody was trying to poach it, and, you know, they, they shot at it, and it's out of season, and you come across a dead animal, and it's fresh, then, of course, at that point, you would definitely want to get a hold of the game warden or some law enforcement, local sheriff will even look into those, and make sure that, you know, you're not picking something up and that, that technically is a crime. Right. So what I'm getting at is what's the difference between me picking up the dead head and then giving it to Mr. Belding to, um, to auction off at Bighorns Unlimited versus calling the department, going through the process, calling the department, getting the permission, applying for the, uh, let's see, I thought there was an application in there somewhere. There is a process when you, I'm sorry, yeah. Ira Hansen, there is a process when the game wardens, when you contact them that they want to fill out a field report. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting point because basically if we take section two, you almost don't need section one. So our goal obviously is with Mel, the original intent of the bill was to make sure, okay, that whatever he's doing is completely legal and there's no question about it because there's there's two other laws that, we, that we're that we going to have to amend to. One is 501-379, unlawful sales of wildlife. Uh, it says, it's unlawful for any person to sell or expose for sale to barter, trade, or purchase, or attempt to sell, barter, trade, or purchase any species of wildlife or parts thereof, except as otherwise provided in the title. So um, when you look in the title, there's only a couple things. So that, that, that's kind of like, okay, how do, we, how do we deal with that? Because now we're selling, in this case, now it's for donated purposes, but it's still a sale. So we're working on getting that amended clean up, uh, cleaned up. And there's a similar provision in 502150. So I am working with LCB and trying to make sure we get all that straightened out so that if you find a dead head. Now also, there are exceptions in law, like for example, um, animal pelts are sold. I think you can sell deer, deer hides. Uh, there's certain things that's perfectly legal to sell now. Um, so it's not like this is some new novel concept. And obviously they, they are, they are commercial collectors of antlers. Um, my day used to be Boy Scouts would go out and, and do it, and now they're uh, people that do it commercially. Uh, so we still want to make sure that industry is regulated and they get the correct licensing and so forth, and they only do it during the regulated time. But again, it's an example of where animal parts are being sold, um, just they've been shed. So there's a few little ambiguities in there that we're still working on, but I think we're getting very close to getting that all figured out. Th thank you. I appreciate that. And just for the record, I have no problem with being, you know, risking redundancy in order to have clarity. And I would support the bill as written with the uh, conceptual amendment and also look forward to whatever other amendments come forward. Thank you. Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just need it clarified and make sure it's clear. A person who takes may take or gather shed antlers and heads with antlers attached for personal or, you know, non-commercial use. Again, does that allow you then to pick up an antler in one of the six counties that is prohibited from, I believe it's January 1 to April 1? It, it would for non-commercial purposes. If I, for example, if Senator Chair Pazina went up to Lincoln County in the Panaca area and they're not in Lincoln and she and her kids or relatives or whatever out hiking and they have the good fortune to come across a deer antler or something like that technically under the current law if she took that thing and removed it and just took it back to her car and a warden shows up she's breaking the law so what we want to make sure is in, in non non-intentional non-commercial applications like that example I want to make sure that there's no crime being committed thank you thank you madam chair Senator Flores, and also Director Janae, I'll stay away from you if I'm trying to break the law. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, could you just help uh, walk through a practical scenario so that I can wrap around the idea of how somebody who's out there and just happens to stumble upon XYZ versus someone who's out there with a commercial in intent? It, is it more of a, it's really just a community, everybody knows each other out there? Um, is it more of the idea that you'll see somebody out there and they're collecting X, Y, Z? Is it the commercial folk come out in teams? And, and so I'm just trying to differentiate uh, how somebody could know the difference, whether you're doing it for, for commercial purposes or not. 
Uh, thank you, Ira Hansen. An excellent question. And the reality is, like in all criminal law, the state has the burden of proving what somebody is doing. So uh, what I would assume a warden would do, number one, is if he's observing, which they typically will do, you know, you're talking wide open areas, and they watch somebody, and, uh, you know, and you see him piling. Uh, by the way, getting antlers out there, it sounds almost like, you know, like there's, there's just laying everywhere. <laughs> but the reality is that's not true. Now, there are some exceptionally good people who understand where animals winter and lose their head, sh sheds and stuff like that. But, but I think a warden in the field could make a pretty good judgment if, for example, it's uh, one of us on this committee doing it and we found one antler and we're back at our car versus it's somebody who they come up to the car and lo and behold, there's four or five sets of antlers that they found and they've been out hiking all day long, they can very reasonably do probable cause and say, you know what, I don't think you're just doing this to take it home to show your kids. I think you've crossed that line. Madam Chair, if I could just do a quick follow-up. And, and I would assume that somebody who's out there for a commercial purpose is probably out there for several days at a time. If you're supervising or watching that person, it makes it abundantly clear they've been out here X amount of days. Um, and, I'm, and again, I was just trying to put that out there because I, I assume there may be some folk who uh, would push back a little bit on that, but I was just trying to draw the line that there's some common sense uh, that will apply and will help differentiate an individual who's just out there hanging out with their family, hiking, having a good time versus somebody who's out there trying to do this for commercial purpose. I, uh, Ira Hansen, I, I completely agree. Look, if somebody's doing commercial, number one, these are remote, remote areas. They're going to spend a fair amount of money just for gasoline and everything else getting out there. They're not going to be trying to, if, if, unless they're really stupid, they're not going to be out there with no permit and not act like they don't know the time frame. And then they're collecting antlers because you know anything about antlers, especially the ones that they sell them by the pound. They're often large. You know, if you find a set of elk antlers, those things are, are enormous. And you're driving out of there on your four-wheeler with several of them on the back, and it's not the season, you don't have the permit or whatever, and a warden catches you, he's not going to get it. You're going to say, oh, I'm just doing this to show my Boy Scouts at back in Las Vegas. No, they're going to give you a citation. And then, honestly, you always got an opportunity on any law to, you know, they got to prove that. They have the obligation to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you were bringing it back for Boy Scouts. Um, but there are strong evidences that a ju justice of the peace would go, oh, wait a minute, buddy, you know. You have, you've, you've collected them before. You've been cited once before by the wardens for something like this, you know. There are, there are uh, ways that a, a, a field warden uh, or anybody with reasonable common sense could figure out the difference between Senator Pazina just going out on a trip with her kids in Panaka area and Ira Hansen who's going into White Pine County and he's got a camp set up and he's up there uh, wandering through it and when they show up at my camp I've got a pile of them stacked up there. That's not what we're trying to trying to protect here. And Senator Gokachia. Oh, okay. Any further questions? All right, wonderful. If you'd like to take a step back from the table, we are going to ask anyone who'd like to testify and support to please step up to the table. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, Joel Blakesley, I just support the concept of this bill. Thank you. Madam Chair, Members of the committee, Steve Walker representing Eureka County. Eureka County is in support of this bill and the amended version. Now that's what I call quick testimony. Anyone else here in Carson City who'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 312? Seeing no one um, and no one in Vegas right now. BPS, is there anyone over the phones who'd like to testify in support? would like to testify in support of SB 312, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you very much. Anyone here in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 312, please step forward.
Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Larry Johnson. I'm president of the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife, and I'm in kind of a awkward position because uh, I think by committee rules I have to sign up in opposition, although I am entirely in support of the concepts of this bill. Uh, but, um, and I would like to thank Mr. Belding and, and Senator Hansen for bringing this forward because I would like to see this concept go forward. Um, was a 30-year director of Nevada Bighorns Unlimited and past president, uh, and I, I got caught up in this uh, years ago when uh, every year I would bring a, a bighorn sheep deadhead in, make coffee tables, auction it off until we got told that I was going to go straight to jail or something. No, that it was illegal. Okay. So, um, I also think that the the provisions of possessing um, deadheads is an appropriate one. My only issue with this is uh, the commission spent two years in adopting shed, hand, shed antler regulations and some of this bill conflicts with certain portions of that. Although I agree with the intent um, to make it very clear that, for example, the seasons that were set in those counties were for specific reasons. We had individuals on ATV chasing uh, uh, bucks and bull elk in the time of year when they are, their body conditions is at, at their worst, their energy levels are low, chasing them through pinion juniper, trying to get them to knock their antlers off so they could collect them. Uh, those seasons are there for a specific reason and whether that be commercial or non-commercial, um, those provisions need to be looked at. The other, what I would ask really is the bill sponsor to sit down with Endow and look at a potential couple of conflicts there and, and come back with uh, exact amendments and because I, I support this going forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else here in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 312? Seeing no one here or in Vegas, BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 312, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. And as you all know, that brings us to neutral. So anyone here in Carson City who would like to testify or in Las Vegas for that matter, who'd like to testify in neutral for Senate Bill 312. Seeing no one racing to the front, BPS, anyone on the phones who'd like to testify in neutral? If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 312, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. All right, Senator Hansen, I see you're ready to make your closing remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know you want to get out of here, and I, I do too. Uh, a couple of things. The amendment puts back in place 100% of what the Wildlife Commission did for the shed antler regulations, okay? So there's no elimination at all. What everything that's in place remains in place. So the one exception is we're going to add the NRS to make sure that that protection for people that are non-commercial hikers or whatever that find it. So I want to make sure that's fine. Now, now I've had the bill... I think Mr. Belding and I went back, shoot, at least a month. It's been on Nellis and everything else. But we have reached out to people. Uh, you know, as I talked to you the other day, I was having a little difficulty getting some of the information from Endow, but that's been corrected. I thank you for your assistance in that, if that was from you. But whoever it was, Mr. Janae worked late into last night providing me all, that deta all those details and just whispered in my ear, he has the bulk of the rest of them as well. I also want to say with Mr. Johnson, Mr. Blakesley, and Mr. Belding, these are three of the most... Um, um, amazing people in the state of Nevada that nobody knows much about. The amount of work they have done conservation-wise, the number of guzzlers they've made, the transplants of animals that they've been involved with, the bighorn populations across the state, th those, those gentlemen right there are really, um, and their organizations, are 
part of, of, of a team of people that have worked on this for what, almost 40 years now. Um, and so I'm very happy, and we're, we're all friends, and we had disagree, like Mr. Johnson coming up. We had a meeting beforehand, but I do want everybody to know that it's a friendly disagreement and that these guys are some, uh, honestly, what should be some of the conservation heroes of the state of Nevada that not many people outside of that NBU group know about. So with that, Madam Chair, we will uh, do all we can to try to incorporate as many uh, um, opinions and, and get this worked out to where everybody's happy. Bottom line is we do want to make uh, allow people like Mr. Belding and MBU and Fraternity of the Desert Bighorn and other groups the opportunity to, to sell this stuff without po facing possible penalties. And then I want to make sure that when the commission adopts those regulations that we have a protection built in place for folks that un innocently pick up a dead head, a skull, or any kind of antler. So with that, I will conclude my testimony, and I thank you very much. Thank you so much. So it looks like no fisticuffs in the back after committee hearing. Thank you so much. With that, we'll close the testimony on Senate Bill number 312, and we will open the hearing on Senate Bill 269, revising provisions related to animal cruelty, as I understand someone has a flight. So we definitely want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we welcome Senator Oren Shaw to the front, as well as his co-presenter, and you're welcome to begin when ready. Thank you very much, Chair Pazina, members of the Senate Natural Resources Committee. Uh, for the record, James Orenshaw, I represent Senate District 21 down in Southern Nevada, and thank you for hearing Senate Bill 269. I'm very lucky to have uh, really, I think, one of, uh, uh, I think of what Senator Hansen said about Mr. Johnson and the other gentleman. I feel that way about Dr. Lane and her work in terms of animal rights. I've known Dr. Lane, oh gosh, I think since I was a teenager. Uh, past uh, professor at UNLV, past president of uh, Las Vegas Humane Society, and someone who not only talks the talk but walks the walk in terms of uh, trying to rescue animals and, and help them out of dangerous situations. Uh, I know that she will go out and try to take care of injured animals and pick them up and try to get them the care they need. Senate Bill 269 uh, comes out of a long discussion I had with Dr. Karen Lane, and it builds upon really groundbreaking work in 2009 from State Senator Randolph Townsend, who sponsored Senate Bill 132, which uh, really worked on some of the restrictions in terms of tethering of dogs. And Senate Bill 269 reexamines some of the exemptions that were in the statute that have been there, I think, for 14 years since Senator Townsend's bill passed in 2009. Additionally, it looks at imposing uh, additional protections for dogs during extreme heat warnings, and there's an amendment proposed by Clark and Washoe counties, which is a friendly amendment, and that also looks at extreme cold temperatures too, because I think now we're seeing extremes that even in 2009 we hadn't seen. I was just talking with the lobbyist for um, Washoe County and talking about how there's still a lot of houses in, in, up here in, in Washoe, Northern Nevada, that were built without air conditioning because you know extreme heat warnings were not heard of, but now they are, they are heard of, even up here. So with your indulgence, Chair Pazina, if I could turn it over to Dr. Karen Lane, and then I'm happy to answer any questions you or the committee have. Thank you again for hearing this bill. Thank you, Senator Orenshaw. And to chair and committee members, um, thank you very much for listening to this presentation on 269. Um, as Senator Orenshaw was saying, the issue um, has been one of tethering um, in the original bill in 2009 was regarding the issue not only of tethering in terms of chaining or using a trolley to move the animal, but also uh, making sure that animals were kept in a situation where their um, cages met the standards so that the animal could stand up turn around within that cage. So that was a, also a second concern of the anti-tethering ordinance from 2009. And so in looking at this, uh, the proposal that you see before you is the first one in um, section two. We talk about adding the idea of making chaining not available during doing heat uh, um, advisories and the reason that we're doing that, as mentioned, is that heat has become a big issue um, in southern Nevada, and, we, and as we've also said, here um, in northern Nevada, for that matter. 
And what we've done is we've, uh, I followed up on, um, I looked at both Clark County and the city of Las Vegas. And they currently have in their statute on this the same kind of thing where they don't allow chaining during heat advisories. And there's also a, another amendment that talks about uh, in really cold uh, advisories as well. The second area that we're changing has to do with the exemptions, and that's on, on subsection four. And if you'll notice prior to um, the changes that are being proposed here, the exemptions were pretty broad. They allowed for both um, animals, uh, dogs that were used to lawfully hunt a species of wildlife, uh, receiving training, dogs that were tra receiving training to hunt a species of wildlife, um, the attendance at a dog show, being kept in a shelter or boarding facility or temporarily in a camping area, being cared for by a rescue organization um, for agriculture purposes, dogs on agriculture uh, land, and also with people having custody or control of a dog if the person is engaged in a temporary task. So in looking at this, these were very broad exemptions, and it seemed after 14 years that there were some cracks that appeared uh, based on these exemptions. And we've seen, for example, in Clark County, for example, boarding facilities have been an issue, particularly in terms of not necessarily tethering, but more so with the size of cages and the housing of animals in terms of how that's done. So this, what you're seeing before you is that we're recommending, um, and I'm sorry, I did forget the a veterinarian was another exemption. So what we're proposing is the deletions for um, the dogs hunting, uh, for dogs as uh, hunting uh, species training. We're also um, keeping, um, being kept in a shelter or boarding facility or temporary in a camping facility a camping area. Now, I will add that there is a friendly amendment to this by both Clark and Washoe, which suggests that when an animal comes into a shelter, that it may be tethered temporarily. And so that seems a reasonable um, thing to do. And you should have a copy of those changes that were proposed. Um, the other is the, uh, let's see, also the rescue. We have had issues with rescues in terms of not so, again, not so much in terms of any tethering, but with the issue of the uh, cage size and, and the, that situation. The only other area that we did originally propose to delete was the person having custody or control of the dog if the person is engaged in a temporary task or activity. And that seems strange to talk about a one hour situation when you're talking about a, a statute that talks about 14 hours. So that was proposed to be removed. But again, Washoe and Clark came back and suggested it's probably important to have that in with the understanding it should include the um, not allowing that to happen when you have a heat alert or um, a cold alert. We'll call that right now a heat advisory or a cold advisory. And those are the issues that we um, that were covered in this particular bill. And Chair Pazina, James Orange Hall State Senate District 21. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Do we have questions from the committee? Senator Gokachia and then Senator Flores. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of places. I've got a couple of concerns. Uh, where you deleted, if you were in a camping area, you know, in some instances, if you're out in the, I, I don't know how you're going to keep that, that pet there without having it tethered uh, in the camping area. That means if you and your family are on vacation and you've got a dog and you decide, well, we're going to go in and eat, do you not tether the dog? Because chances are when you come back, he's gone. So uh, this would make it against the law for you to do that as I read it. Um, through the chair to Senator Gokachia, 
Um, Senator, please I, go direct. Thank you. Um, I think that the issue is that um, if you're in a camping area, uh, normally what happens is that, for example, Animal Protective Services operates on a complaint basis. So if someone complains, say, for example, in an urban or a rural area, your neighbor may complain about an animal, animal being tethered for a long period of time or, you know, say for more than 14 hours. So then Animal Protective Services will go out there and check. The question I guess I would have is who's going, first of all, who's going to make the complaint, if that makes sense? How are you going to make the complaint? And is, it's very difficult um, in urban areas, for example, if you're trying to determine that an animal has been tethered for 14 hours, you almost have to keep a diary of that information to make sure they're over that time period. So I'm just not, you know, that's my concern. And if, if you have a better, if there's a better way that we can indicate that. No, I, I'm fine. And, and I guess I want to make sure it's on the record. And it has to be over four, 14 hours then. At yes, any sir. any instance, so if, technically, if, you can tether the dog in a camping area overnight and not be in violation of this law. It's for, over 14 hours. That's correct. Okay, I, and I was very glad to see you reinstated the the one section. Uh, you know, because that, that was going to be problematic. Then the only other thing, does that make you in violation? Then, if you've got a dog and you're walking your dog, temporary task activity, for more than an hour, and there's a heat or cold warning. I mean, you know, you might leave the house and you it's your normal practice. You take your dog, you've got him on a leash, hopefully, because that's required also in some urban areas. And uh, you're walking him, it's over an hour, and you didn't know there was a heat advisory on. You're out there walking, you're hoping the dog's making it, or, or you're, it, it's a, a cold weather advisory, and you're not froze up, so you're hoping to, and, and I guess, you know, I, I live in the rural, so... Dogs like cold. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to you and three, uh, Chair Pazina, to Senator Gokachia. Please continue to go oh. direct, and thank you. Thank you, Chair. S Senator Gokachia, I believe the existing language at NRS 574.100, and that's uh, over on, in the bill. It's on page 2, lines 28 through 36, carrying on to the next page. I, I, I don't think that covers someone walking their dog because it talks about you know a person shall not restrain a dog using a tether chain tie trolley or pulley system or other device that is less than 12 feet in length fails to allow the dog to move at least 12 feet or if the device is a pulley system fails to allow the dog to move a total of 12 feet or allows the dog to reach a fence or other object that may cause the dog to become injured or die by strangulation after jumping the fence and using the prong pinch I was just working on your amendment here E and it says with a person having custody or control of the dog, if the dog is engaged in a temporary task or activity for more than an hour. I, I, I'm only with your amendment, not, I read the, the bill as you presented early on, yeah, but I guess I'm concerned about that. That would put you in violation if there was an advisory, a weather event. Well, and, oh, I, well I would say this, Senator Kokichi, believe me that if they issue a heat alert in Clark County, it's hot. I mean, it's really hot. And, you know, we try to get everyone to, during the sum, just a regular summertime, to walk their, I'm sure as you understand, their dogs early in the morning or late at night because the pavement's hot. And so if it would make sense that um, the U.S. Weather Service does uh, come out in, in Clark County, you'll often see, uh, based on the weather advisory, that shelters will open up as well for humans. So, I mean, I think that people know it's just too hot. And in terms of being cold, I, I can't really address that, but I know that heat is a big issue um, for animals. And I think that that's why that was addressed the way it was. Yeah. And I was more looking at the cold side, like I say, you know, dogs love the cold. We've had a- Really quickly, uh, we've ma'am, can you please state your name service. for the record just for our committee secretary so we can ensure your name is in the notes for your response? I'm sorry. No, thank Dr. You. Karen Lane, L-A-Y-N-E. Thank you thank so you. much. And I won't belabor it, but again, we've had a National Weather Service warning since last November, once a week, you know, so 
you're not going to get much, the dog's not going to get much walk time <laughs> if you couldn't be out with him. And again, like I say, it's just maybe we can back away from the cold weather a little bit. I live in the north. I understand hot pavement. But uh, cold weather, I get a little iffy. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Flores? I, I, no, I think my question's been addressed. I, I think I was just misreading the, the amendment. Um, it, just to be 100% clear, uh, your amendment as presented here is only indicating when uh, sections two and three do not apply. In other words, if you have the dog and there is uh, uh, an advisory, whether extreme heat or cold we weather, um, in that scenario, I'm fine. I'm in compliance because this this is just making it abundantly clear sections two and three didn't apply. I get it. Um, I was just misreading your amendment. And then I was going to ask how the procedurally how a scenario would arise where somebody is notified, but it's always a third party who's picking up the phone, which ultimately triggers that issue. So even in, in Senator Goykachia's concern, the fact that if you're out there hunting or camping, the likelihood of somebody picking up the phone there is just not really going to capture any of those scenarios. So I, you, I think I just wanted to kind of walk through it practically, and I think you've already done that. So I, I don't really have a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Senator. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, with that, we'll have you step back from the table and we will take testimony in support of Senate Bill 269. Thank you, Chair. We will start in Carson City and then move to Las Vegas. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Cadence Matijevic, representing Washoe County. Uh, I did check with your staff to be sure that it was okay that I came in support since we have an amendment, uh, which the sponsor has accepted as friendly. Um, as it states on our document, we're, we're looking to accomplish a couple of things. I'm gonna walk through it and then hopefully try to address some of the concerns uh, that were expressed, try to do that within the two minutes. Um, it, the proposed amendment would pre prevent the restraint of a dog during extreme cold weather events. Uh, we recognize that there probably does need to be some work on defining extreme cold weather events. Um, I've reached out to a colleague, to, to someone that I know at the National Weather Service to try to get their guidance on that. Um, in, in in their many page glossary, there is not one succinct cold weather. Um, there's, there's several different references. They're scientists, we love them for it. Uh, so we'll try to, uh, to work on that language. Um, and it also would exclude an animal shelter from the provisions uh, while the dog is being, of, of the bill, while the dog is being processed into the shelter and restore an exception to the provisions of NRS 574.100 subsection two currently codified uh, unless a heat or extreme cold weather advisory as we work on that further definition is issued. Um, I, if I may, I, I'd like to address Senator Goykachia's uh, questions. Um, certainly our understanding of the intent of this bill would not define tether uh, as, as a leash um, that's used for an activity. We, it, that amendment was contemplating where perhaps uh, you would be working and the animal would be tethered next to you or some distance away from you to a fixed object. You might be working outside, but for whatever reason, need to tether the animals so that they're not chasing the geese or whatever. Um, but it was not, from our perspective, intended in any way to prohibit uh, walking with a dog for a period of longer than an hour. Uh, and if there's work that needs to happen on that language to clarify that, uh, we're certainly open to that. Senator Gokachia does have a question for you. Not really a question, more of a comment. I have to apologize to the good senator. I was beating him up on your amendment. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, okay, with that, uh, yeah, and, and I agree. I, you're saying a dog can't be tied, and again, we're talking about the 14 hours whether just eat, whether you're there in the presence or not, he shouldn't be tied in a cold weather event. I was more, and, and you're, if that's agreeable with the senator, again, I'm talking about walking a dog or you've got the dog on a leash. And I, 
and I dare anybody to walk my dog on a 12-foot leash or have you tied up before you get the first block. Uh, you know, that's just uh, so, again, I'm hoping the leash is a little shorter. Uh, th or that is acceptable to be on something shorter if you're actually walking a dog or got him with you. For the record, Cadence Mat Matijevich, Senator Greg Kachia, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Natural uh, Resources Committee. My name is Jeff Rogan. I represent Clark County. Uh, ditto to everything my colleague from the North said regarding this bill. We worked together, or this amendment, we worked together on it. Um, we think it's a good amendment. We're happy that the Senator accepted it. Just by way of background, some of the changes that we proposed are just from uh, current practice. We obviously don't want dogs who are, we don't know their temperament that are being brought into a shelter to have a long tether, or to be required to be tethered at, at great length because they'll interact with other dogs that are also being processed into the shelter that we don't know what their temperaments are and we don't want them fighting. Additionally, with regard to the temporary tasks or activities for not more than an hour, our concern was our parks. People bring our dogs to our parks. Um, if they're having a picnic or they're hanging out with their children and their family, we don't want a 12-foot tether to be the minimum size of the tether because that could interfere with other park users. And so we wanted the ability to have a shorter tether, maybe of six feet or eight feet, so that they're closer to the family and not interfering with other park users. So thank you very much for your time, and I urge your support on uh, this bill. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, David Cherry with the City of Henderson. Um, the City of Henderson operates an animal shelter. We also obviously engage in animal control activities. I um, want to thank Washoe and Clark County for bringing this amendment forward, and um, I'm operating under the what uh, Caden said was okay with the committee in terms of, of uh, supporting the amendment in the um, support position. Um, so we do believe that this improves the bill um, and also addresses some of our concerns. We also would look forward to being part of the conversation around some of the definitions when it comes to the extreme cold weather and also just making sure that we understand exactly where for the purposes of enforcement we would be able to, to reference when those advisories are um, posted, you know, for the purposes of having to go backward in case we were bringing enforcement action to make sure that on a certain date at a certain time we could reference one of those advisories being in effect. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're going to head down to Las Vegas, sir, if you'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 269. Good evening. Victor Zavala, Supervisor for Clark County Animal Protection Services. Uh, I'm here for any questions that may have, the committee may have uh, not in support or against. Committee, do you have any questions for this gentleman? Okay, no questions for now. Is there anyone else who'd like to come up to the table in Las Vegas or in Carson City in support? BPS, anyone over the phones in support of SB 269? If you would like to testify in support of SB 269, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Anyone in Carson City or Las Vegas who would like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 269, please come forward. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Erica Roth, E-R-I-C-A-R-O-T-H, on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. Um, I first want to thank the sponsors and Dr. Lane for speaking me, with me about this bill um, and about some proposed amendments, and I look forward to continuing those conversations. Uh, my opposition today is specifically as to removing the exemptions for rescues. I'm in kind of a unique position as both a public defender uh, where criminal liability could possibly be imposed and also as a dog rescuer or former dog rescuer. I have fostered 10 foster dogs um, and seen firsthand what happens when dogs are taken from high kill shelters and often placed into temporary but not the most ideal housing situations before they're adopted out to their families. And so um, we're opposed to removing those exemptions for the rescues. I think that we can narrow in on some specific language that gets to actual conduct. 
um, by any bad actors in those rescues, but um, that's where we stay opposed. Um, the other concern is with unhoused pet owners and how this can potentially affect those who are living or sleeping outside and whether or not and how long they can tether their animals. So that is another concern of ours, but I do look forward to continuing our conversations um, with the bill sponsors. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for your work with rescues. Thank you, Madam Chair. John Puro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. We share the same concerns that the Washoe County Public Defender's Office uh, has and we look forward to working to find a resolution. <clears throat> For the record, Steve Walker representing Eureka and Lyon counties. First of all, I want to apologize to Senator Orenshaw. I tried to catch him all day to, to say talk about our opposition. I didn't make it. Uh, specific to Eureka County, it's removal of Section 1, Sub 4, Sub B, specific to hunting dogs. Uh, that, that they would like that removed from the bill. If that was removed from the bill, it would be uh, their issue would go away. Lyon County th thinks that their, their, is, their main issue is, is something that Senator Gogachia brought up, the clarification on the language uh, if you're walking a dog during a cold or hot weather, uh, is, is that a violation? And they also have concerns about enforcement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone either in Carson City or Las Vegas in opposition of SB 269 who has not yet come forward? Seeing no one at the moment coming forward to the tables. BPS, is there anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 269, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Is there anyone in either Las Vegas or Carson City who'd like to step forward in neutral on Senate Bill 269? If so, please come forward to the tables. Seeing no one stepping forward toward either table, BPS, is there anyone on the phones in neutral? If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 269, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. All right, thank you so much. I haven't seen anyone else come to the table here or in Grant Sawyer Building in Las Vegas. So with that, we'd love to have the bill sponsor and presenter come back to the front. Chair Pazina, members of the uh, Senate Committee on Natural Resources, James Orange Hall, Senate 21. It's not often I get a star witness who flies up from Las Vegas on a day trip, so I appreciate you hearing our bill out of order so that I can try to uh, get Dr. Lane back to the Reno Airport to catch her flight back to Las Vegas. I want to clarify, if, if with your permission, Chair Pazina, Senator Gokuchia's question, I was going over it with uh, Dr. Lane, and I don't believe Senator Townsend's original bill in, in 2009 existing statute or this bill was ever meant to apply to anyone who's walking their dog. Uh, this is for a dog being tethered or the other discussion we had regarding um, housing and, and cages. I certainly committed to try to work with everybody that had concerns and, and hopefully we can reach resolution. And with your indulgence, Chair Pazina, if I could allow Dr. Lane to make the closing comments. Um. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you so much for allowing us to present this bill today. And as Senator Orenshaw has said, we'll definitely try to sit down with those who still have some concerns and try to see what we can work out on the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much and safe travels back to Las Vegas. We appreciate your coming up. <laughs> and Senator Orenshaw, we'll look forward to seeing you back here on Thursday. Well, thank you so much. With that, we'll now close the hearing on Senate Bill 269, and we will open the hearing on Senate Bill 364. And we would like to welcome Senator Krasner up to the table to present and any co-presenters that she may have joining her.
Good morning, Chair Pazina and members of the Senate Natural Resources Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm Senator Lisa Krasner, and I proudly represent State Senate District 16. I'm here today to present SB 364, which regards uh, cultural remains. Uh, I was asked to bring this bill by one of the members of the 28 tribes here in Nevada. I was told that the current procedure when human bones are found that appear to be ancient cultural remains is that the sheriff goes out and puts the remains in a box and brings them back to the coroner's office. The Native American Indians would like to go out at the same time to the site with the sheriff and pray over the remains. That's it. That's the whole bill. There is an amendment. Do you guys all have? Okay. Uh, so the amendment is very short and terse, uh, and as the bill is, and merely applies to Section 1, Sub 1, which is on the back of the bill. Uh, so it says, um, the current writing on the bill says, if a law enforcement agency goes to a location where human remains are found that are thought to be Native Indian, the law enforcement agency must communicate and collaborate with a representative of an Indian tribe. And the amendment just changes that to say, if a law enforcement agency goes to a location where human remains are found that are thought to be native Indian, the law enforcement agency must communicate and collaborate with a representative of an Indian tribe located in the county where the remains are found or the State Historic Preservation Office, otherwise known as SHPO. Uh, it doesn't change anything else. It doesn't make any changes to any other existing law. Um, my co-presenter is uh, former speaker, John Osegura, and he's here to uh, answer any questions you might have, unless you have a short presentation as well, sir. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon presenting SB 364 with Senator Krasner. I'm John Oseguera with Strategies 360 here today representing the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. In uh, just a, some brief history here, in 2017, um, the Reno Sparks Indian Colony brought forth a bill that was SB 244. Some of my remarks are a restatement of former Senator State, State Senator Raddy's remarks. SB 244 sought to clarify and to ensure that American Indian tribes in Nevada were included in private and public forums in which the management, treatment, and disposition of American Indian cultural items, human remains, funerary objects, and sacred items of cultural significance were discussed and deliberated. The bill set forth tribal involvement in those activities. The most effective way to understand the significance and appropriate management of cultural items and remains is to have meaningful participation and con consultation with the tribes. I want to emphasize consultation because that is a very important concept in why we bring SB 364 today. Like the bill in 2017, this bill attempts to clarify Nevada tribes' participation in respectful handling, disposition, and repatriation of cultural items and ancestral remains. So SB 364 does two things. I'll start with section two of the bill first. What we're trying to accomplish with section two of this bill is exactly what I just described a moment ago. SB 244 of the 2017 session required the Office of Historic Preservation of the State Department of Conservation to, without limitation, adopt regulations which set forth the process for repatriation patriation, easy for me to say, um, of prehistoric American Indian human remains and funerary objects. The regulations should have been developed in consultation with American Indian tribes and incorporated the values, beliefs, and traditions of American Indian tribes as determined and conveyed by their respective members during the consultation with the Office of Historic Preservation. Since 2017, <laughs> The regulations have not been promulgated, nor has meaningful consultation taken place. Bluntly, if passed, this is one of those situations where the legislature is now, as my former colleague Barbara Buckley used to say, 
telling the agency we really, really mean it this time. <laughs> another issue um, that is off, uh, that has been, another issue has been that often when laypersons discover remains, they don't know what to do. Um, usually their inclination is to call law enforcement. Section one of the bill sets forth procedures of who law enforcement is to notify in these situations. Currently, in some cases, when law enforcement or the coroner is called, the remains are boxed up and set on a shelf somewhere. And section one of this bill intends to give law enforcement guidance in what to do in these situations. As Senator Krasner mentioned in her remarks about the proposed amendment, law enforcement or the coroner has the ability to notify the Office of Historic Preservation if they're unfamiliar with who to notify um, at the tribe in their jurisdiction. Madam Chair, uh, I stand to answer any questions and work with any interested parties. For those of you who were here in 2017, this was a controversial bill at the time, but through hard work of a lot of people, we were able to come to a compromise that made the bill work for everyone. And we, learn, we look forward to addressing any concerns that may come after this hearing and just appreciate your time. Any questions from the committee? Wow, you stunned us all to silence. All right, with that said, thank you so, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we can now have you step back from the table, and with that, we'll hear testimony in support of Senate Bill 364. Hello, I'm Will Adler with Stiller State Government Relations representing the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe today. Uh, Pyramid Lake would like to take this opportunity to thank Rainer Sparks Indian Colony uh, and especially Marla Lake McDay Williams for all the, the time spent on this bill and sort of the idea of actually following through and getting uh, these, these historic, you know, remains and other, other documentation pieces done and actually promulgated through regulations and getting this, you know, sort of sticking the landing as, as Osagir said really, really asking them to do it correctly this time. But uh, this has been a long process and one that is uh, important to all tribal communities across Nevada and is one that we uh, appreciate bringing forward today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Is there anyone either in Las Vegas or here in Carson City who would like to speak in support? BPS, is there anyone over the phone lines who'd like to speak in support of SB 364? If you would like to testify in support of SB 364, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Uh, thank you, Chair and the Committee on Natural Resources for the opportunity to speak today. I'll move, Pisha Tubino, New Machina, Minina, Hello, my name is James Phoenix. I'm the chairman of the Pyramid Party Tribe in Northern Nevada. I'm also a retired police officer and lieutenant colonel. Of Sir, the thank Army you National so much. Guard. Can I also I have you still. spell your name just very briefly for our committee secretary? Thank you very much for calling in. Uh, and my name is James Phoenix and common spelling, first name, last name, P-H-O-E-N-I-X. Uh, I support Bill SB 364. Why? Uh, bring awareness to the law enforcement agencies, second communicate and collaborate through regulations necessary to carry out the provisions of NRS 383-150 to 383-440 inclusive. Our people were the original inhabitants of the Great Basin and have been here for over 6,000 years. There are certain places throughout the state where our people have lived and died all throughout the Great Basin. It should go without notice or without saying that regulation must be established in consultation with Indian tribes and incorporate the values, beliefs, and the traditions of the people of the Great Basin as determined and conveyed by the members of the tribe. Life is precious to us all, and death is just as precious to our people. It's our way of life. Our people in Nevada, our people are Nevada history. So like all other rudiments in Nevada history, I, re I recommend that this great state of Nevada shall preserve it and have it regulated. Therefore, please take the time to commit to our Native American population here in the Great Basin so that it does not go unnoticed or become less of a priority and adopt regulations not later than 31 December 2023. In closing, I want to thank all committee members and I support SB 364 as proposed by the senators 
and the Committee of Natural Resources. Appreciate you, James Phoenix, Privately Play You Trust. Thank you, Mr. Phoenix. BPS, is there anyone else on the phones in support of Senate Bill 364? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. All right, with that, we will take any testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 364. Either in Carson City or Las Vegas, please step forward to the table. EPS, is there anyone on the phone lines who'd like to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 364? If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 364, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. And seeing no one step up to the table here in Carson City or at Grant Sawyer Building in Las Vegas, I'd like to ask anyone who'd like to testify in neutral to please come forward to the tables and here and in Las Vegas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, James Sotomayor, Director, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, where SHPO is housed and located. In that respect, we're neutral on the bill in the respect. Uh, it mainly affects us within Section 2. I was unaware of the amendment until today, so I'll have to go back and try to research that. We don't necessarily see any issues within the bill. It will require a little bit of money for implementation. When museums originally did this, it took 19 meetings over a three-and-a-half-year period. I appreciate if there is a deadline. Uh, in order to facilitate the concept of having meetings in a more timely manner on all parties so that we can try to get these regulations done. Maybe we'll also be able to utilize some of the regulations that museum put forward uh, in that respect. My understanding is, unfortunately, I did vote on this bill back in 2017. <laughs> uh, so I appreciate Speaker Rossiger bringing that up. Uh, but in that respect, when it passed, the museums were a shall and SHPO was inside the legislation states, shall as necessary, which when you add all those words together, some people construe as may. And for some reason, the previous director in this position, the previous administration chose not to go forward with the regulations. So uh, with that, sorry that occurred, we'll try to rectify that if that is the intent of the body to make sure we get it done and get the regulations done, but I would love to have a time frame or some legislative guidance to all parties that this needs to be done in a fairly quick manner. Thank you. Uh, again, for questions, as you, if you wish, Chair. However, I may have to phone a friend. Any questions for Director Settlemeyer? Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Is there anyone else who'd like to testify in neutral, either in Las Vegas or in Carson City? BPS, anyone on the phone lines who'd like to testify in neutral? If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 364, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Senator Krasner, former Speaker Osagar, would either of you like to come up and give a closing statement? Okay. With that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 364. And our final order of business will be public comment. As a reminder, you do have two minutes per person to speak, and we can add anything additional into written comments, that which will be added to the testimony given to the secretary for the record. Anyone here in Carson City or in Las Vegas who'd like to make public comment, please step forward to the table, and we would love to hear from you. As a reminder, though, it cannot be any testimony on the bills presented here today. Seeing no one stepping up to the tables in either Vegas or in Carson City, BPS, anyone over the phone lines who'd like to make public comment? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. All right, seeing no public comment, this meeting is adjourned.